necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Jen Cruz, and this is the Junior Journey Radio Show. It's Wednesday night. We're showing up as the She Squatchers. So I've got my trusty teammate, Jenna Grover, on the line. Hey, Jenna, are you there? I'm here and happy to be here once again. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hey. Uh I am so excited to tell everybody the news. Last week, we had Ronald Murphy on with us. He was talking about Bigfoot cryptids and fairies. And immediately after the show, everybody was asking, when is he coming back on? And I said, well, it's going to be a while. We're booked up. We had a cancellation for tonight. So I asked Ron, could you please, 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 please come back on the show and do a part two? And he said, yes. <laughs> That's right. As soon as you needed me, isn't it? As Yay. soon as you said, Ron, we need you, I said, time and place. <laughs> yes. That's yes. awesome. He had to clear his schedule. So this is my favorite show. Ah, oh my That's gosh. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. And last week on this day, your book came out, published on Amazon. It's called On Fairies by That's Ronald correct. Murphy. That's correct. How exciting is that? Very exciting. Very exciting. It's uh, the seventh book on my On series, so I'm excited that that's continue to grow. That's awesome. Very, very cool. So what yes. are the other seven books? Oh, let's see here. Um, the first one was On Mermaids, because my daughter Willow asked me to write a book about that. So then I wrote On um, Dogman Tracking the Werewolf Through History, On what the Bigfoot through history. Um, and then I wrote um, On Ghosts. And then I wrote a book called um, On Aquatic Creatures of the Great Lakes. And then I wrote On Fairies. See, you're a well established author then. Congratulations. I, I am. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. It's a lot of hard work, but I do enjoy it. And I do have other books. I, I wrote a regional book called The Haunted History of Westmoreland County, which is the county in which I reside in. And then I wrote um, The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, A Trip to the Goblin Universe of Western Pennsylvania. And uh, so those are the paranormal books that really kind of got me started. But I really like this on series because I can explore a, a particular topic. Uh, you know, uh, you know, just really focus on it. The On Fairies book is a, is a rather lengthy book. It's about 300 pages, about 80,000 words. So it's novel length. Not all books are, the, are, are of that, you know, that um, that in depth. But uh, with, with fairies, you had to get pretty well in depth. With it. Well, of course. Yeah. So yeah. you've got although, the fairies. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, although well, whenever I was writing my book on Bigfoot, um, you know, you would come, I, I, I have a, a chapter in that book called uh, uh, Littlefoot, you know, because there's these small little diminutive wild man creatures around the world, too, uh, here in Pennsylvania, not in western Pennsylvania where I live, but in central Pennsylvania, they have something there called the Elbit Witch, which I think we spoke of very briefly last time, um, and this is a little creature, a little hair-covered creature um that um the, the native americans in that region had you know documented for centuries within their oral tradition um but um it, it's interesting because all these little wild man creatures around the world are very similar to fairies because they all have magical powers or some sort of magical properties oh, wow. oh yeah. So, yeah what kind of magical powers just give us a few examples 
Well, the, the most common is the ability to uh, materialize and dematerialize at will, you know, appearing and disappearing. That is usually the most common thing that you'll find. Uh, but whenever you took a look at the Menahue, uh, Menahune of, uh, of Hawaii, these were cultural icons to the Hawaiian people because they were able to make uh, fishing ponds and introduce certain types of techniques to humankind. Um, so that would have been seen as magical as well. So these were great, um, you know, innovators and builders and such. Um, and I think that there's something to be said about the idea of these small little creatures around the world uh, being related to fairies because they're so intrinsically entwined. Mm -hmm. Of course, the you have the puck wedgie up in the uh, the New England area, and that is, you know, that could be that could be kind of construed as a Bigfoot creature, uh, and it's it's believed to have magical properties as well. Have you ever looked at at um, writing a book on the puck wedgie? Well, he, I, I, I've written um, the, my book on the Chestnut Ridge, on Bigfoot, on fairies, all have um, puck wedgie resources in there. I don't know oh, if I can get a whole. Yeah, I don't know if I can get a whole book out of the puck wedgie, um, but um, I, I that's my favorite word to say. <laughs> it's like one word. Like puck wedgie. Puck yeah. wedgie. That I'll tell you what, uh, you ladies that are, yep, you ladies that are in the know about these fairies, um, you know, whenever you look at the European tradition, um, you have this great uh, character of the, the the puka, right, the puck, uh, that Shakespeare became. So isn't it kind of you know weird that you know three thousand miles apart by an ocean you have something called a puka, and then the Native American culture has something called the puck wedgie, which has a similar type of root sound. So is it possible that these creatures, that is the name mm -hmm. for these creatures, that uh, people have just, you know, translated uh, throughout the ages? That's very, that's a very good point. Very good point. Well, I appreciate that. But yeah, I, I've always been fascinated by the idea of fairies and my, my, ma my magic as well. And the last time I was on, you know, we talked about the magical abilities of, of Bigfoot as well, too. You know, people have claimed that it can disappear and reappear and, uh, you know, I'm not not able to succumb to being fired at by bullets. So it has all these kind of mystical properties, these metaphysical properties as well. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. It, <clears throat> so on your when you did the book on Bigfoot, uh -huh. did you have a section in there about Bigfoot and UFOs? I did not. Um, I'm not a UFO guy. Um, and um, my, my uh, Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge does have a huge section not only on ufos but on the bigfoot ufo um you know connection if there is one i'm not a ufo guy um it's something that has you know been a passing interest of mine but not really my forte uh but you know here in western pennsylvania there is this really long-standing tradition of ufo and bigfoot activity uh, going together hand in hand but if you look at it you know even by extent uh, we're talking about Bigfoot activity, UFO activity, and in many places where this is occurring, there's also um, instances of hauntings. So it's kind of like a perfect storm for all things paranormal. See, that's I love that word, the perfect storm. That is such a, it's such a good word. It's one of my favorites. I use it as, as much as possible, a perfect um, it's, storm. It, it's my second, second uh, uh, favorite phrase besides the puck budget. Really? Oh my gosh, we have so much in common. I'm telling you, and they both begin with P. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. You are good. You're so smart. <laughs> you are so well, smart. You know, I, I, I can write a book, so yeah. <laughs> well, some may say. No, uh, like, oh, <laughs> I'm totally that, kidding. Uh, <laughs> although I told you, no, no, there was a guy on, uh, on uh, uh, Amazon that gave me a zero star review for my vampire book. Look. I would think that if you're able to buy a book and read it cover to cover, that that would warrant at least one star, you know. Yeah. But uh, this guy was from England, and he was kind of goth. You know, he was in, like, his mid-40s. He probably still lived in his parents' basement. And he thought that, you know, he was a vampire uh, because, you know, I'm not going to take this sitting lightly. And oh. uh, he thought that he knew this vampiric tradition more than anybody else. So anything that I could add to it was not worthwhile. So. Yeah, so, but he gave me a zero star review. So, what was his basis of his review? I don't understand because you're a very good writer. 
Well, I appreciate that. I don't know what his basis is. Really, I, I, I do not know. Um, I, um, I'm pretty full of myself, so occasionally I'll Google myself at night, <laughs> and uh, I just found he wrote this, this, this really weird blog spot about me on some sort of, you know, network someplace. Oh, now I'm scared to Google myself and find out what people might be writing about me. Oh, you got to Google yourself, guys. I you don't, have to Google yourself. I don't, I think I've Googled myself. I think I Googled myself like a year ago or two years ago and there was nothing. There was no pictures. There was no name, anything. I couldn't find myself. There was other Jennifer Grovers out there. Jenna, you know, but yeah. So I don't well, think I I'm out there very much. If, if, if we meet up in, um, in uh, uh, Minnesota, I guarantee the next day there will be picture posts. <laughs> I hope they're good. Make sure they're good. <laughs> <laughs> so sir, I can't sir, laugh because of my tuberculosis, remember? Yeah, that's, that's right. Bad. Sir Brian is in the chat room and he says, I'm going to convert Ron into being a UFO guy at the PA of Bigfoot camping weekend when I conduct a CE-5 and bring the UFOs yeah. in for interactions with all who are there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to attempt it. Look, what he does is very interesting. Um, he has this particular skill that I do not. Um, my contention is whenever it comes to the idea of Bigfoot or aliens, I, I don't know where these things come from. What happens if they come from the same source? You know, I don't think we're necessarily looking for life outside of our planet. I think we're looking for life that exists, you know, outside of our dimension. And that changes things a little bit. But I'm not going to be the one looking for flying saucers at night. But what's going to happen with Brian and I at the Big, Bigfoot uh, PA Bigfoot camping experience is that we're going to bring two very specialized approaches um, to the field on a on a night hike. So we're going to look at the idea of Bigfoot not merely as a terrestrial figure, but possibly a metaphysical figure as well too. And then this possible uh, UFO connection. So I think this is going to be a very interesting hike when we do it. See, that's awesome. That's great to have two views. It's so important, especially you guys are very, very particular in your own views. So right. that's going to be. So are you guys going to write about it? How are you going to share about it? What are um, you going to do? I, I think if, if Brian's going, we're probably going to broadcast them up. Oh, at the like live? Yeah, why not? Oh, well, very cool. I, why couldn't we have one of these kind of uh, live Facebook whatever they're called, these Facebook things, uh, while we're doing it. And if that's the case, um, then people could comment if they are experiencing anything as well. I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Sometimes Facebook Live does not work out in the wilderness, out in the woods. You get uh, really right, poor reception. Right. So I don't yeah. know if you want to do it live or if you want to maybe have somebody video it at the same time to just right. have a backup. Like Because Jen and I and Tammy, we've had it happen to us where it's like we – are we're cutting doing, it in and out yeah. we're doing facebook that's lives and we don't know we're yeah, cutting it in and out <laughs> yeah and we're like hey yeah, that's, everybody that's, that's yeah yep yeah yeah that's a very good point because we are going to be out in uh in the world so, yeah yeah well either way either way i can't wait to hear it i cannot wait for you to uh experience that hike uh in virtual reality whenever it's over wouldn't that be neat to do it in virtual virtual reality? Would be. It, well, you know, kind of like watching it, I guess, kind of virtual reality because you're not really there, but you can see things moving around and everything. I wonder, do you guys both have, um, uh, what have I got? I can't remember all of a sudden. A GoPro. Yes. Do you both have GoPros? Because that would be really cool to see from both of your angles yeah. and points of view. Yeah. Brian does. I own no significant pieces of technology whatsoever whenever i go out on a bigfoot hunt i take a uh flashlight and a polaroid camera that's right <laughs> i'm a little i'm a little behind the times no actually polaroids are really good because it captures boom you know boom right there. boom mm -hmm. that's right that's right um but yeah I'm, I'm behind i mean i've been out with people that have these clear cameras and these state-of-the-art things i don't even know how to turn them on so uh, I, I, I appreciate people that use that. And uh, Brian is a good guy whenever it comes to that because he knows all the ins and outs. Oh, that's great. That's super. Yeah. Jenna has a fleer. I Does do. He? I do. I love this fleer, but it just doesn't do the distance for me. See, that's the thing that I've ran into. What is the, um, 
the range on that? What are we looking at for a good usable range? You know, I can't give you the exact range because I don't know off off the top of my head, so I don't want to give of, incorrect information. But it's not it's not, it's not far as enough. far as I'd like it to be at all. Yeah, I mean, I've been out before, and I I, I, I maybe a few trees depth away is what we were looking at with this thing. You know, I guess you could have one of the really super are really expensive, but uh, I don't know. I'm glad you have one, though. You use it for different things, not only Bigfoot, Catherine, right? Oh, yeah. We we actually set up and we got to see, we were we had some interesting ideas about um, checking out some bears and, and watching an area that bears happen to be in. And we were using a FLIR and we were also using a monocular, right, Jen, a monocular? Um, a monocular, unocular. Unocular. <laughs> and, a, and a monocular. Yeah, we had some great footage of the bear. Uh, so, but we didn't run into Bigfoot that night. Uh, that, that's, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. I know. Yeah, yeah, but it was it was fun. Oh, don't you, Jenna? Jenna? Jenna has gotten rid of her fear of bears. Yes, I was literally yeah. like a foot away from this bear, and I had no idea. I mean, I went and and I wanted to unwrap the Twinkies because we went to the store and I was like, yeah. oh, I'm gonna buy them Twinkies because I've seen all these things on TV about you know bears loving things, sweet things, and I was like, Jen, I really can't wait to do this. I'm gonna go do this, and you've got to videotape me. So I walk up with my baggie, you know, and I'm like, boom, 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 boom. And my heart is just like, oh my gosh, uh-huh. I can't believe I'm doing this. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I throw it in the in this great big bin. And the bear jumps out on the other side of the bed. And I'm like, holy nuts. And I turn around <laughs> and I walk like I'm pretending to be all like, cool. This is cool. I'm really cool. You know, I'm not scared at all. Right, whatever. Right, right. I get back to the car and I said, let me see. Let me see. Jen gets my arm. She didn't even get me. And she goes, okay, you want to do it again? I was like, seriously, no. Oh, my goodness. Was, I know. But it was really, really exciting. I mean, I still have the fear of bears. But I mean, hey, you know. Right. Well, how, how did you know the bear was there? Oh, I, it's an area that I'm very familiar with, and the bears eat there. There, it's a garbage dump, and they just come in and jump in the dumpsters and they eat. And um, they're very tame. Okay. Well, not tame. I mean, you can't go, "Hey, take the Twinkie out of my uh-huh. hand," but well, they don't yeah. attack. Or... Actually, and I the... have I have fed a bear over near there pretty pretty much out of my hand but um <laughs> these are wild animals ladies these are wild animals yeah yeah yeah, yeah. sorry i wouldn't do that jen even if it was on live television i'd be like so well, i didn't give it to it out of i mean i just it got close and i just tossed it to it just a couple feet was your heart pitter pattering pounding out of your chest no the person who was driving the car was like this bear's gonna scratch the car oh. <laughs> it, must have been a, it must have been a man i think i know who it and was i didn't think of it jumping up on the car i was like oh yeah i better just toss it because i was gonna just let it take it out of my hand because i i knew that it was a nice bear right but it's still a wild animal so there's really no such thing as like a nice bear yeah, well, dogs can attack. You know, there is no specifically like nothing's really, really tame. Wild animals are wild animals. I know dogs are, are pets, but they can still attack. You know. Oh, sure they can. Sure they can. Um, this is an interesting point. Whenever you're talking about um, uh, with the bears, because the idea of habituation is pretty big now in the uh, Bigfoot uh, field. You know about the idea of having something. And somebody was selling a house. I believe that it was in Tennessee supposedly habituated to a Bigfoot on the property. And they were yeah, it was in Georgia. It was in Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Okay. And they were advertising that it was habituated for Bigfoot. So they were, had been feeding the Bigfoot every day. And uh, so, you know, Bigfoot hunters might be interested in purchasing something like that. And it used to be that people would never even mention this because it would be a deterrent to purchasing the property. His Bigfoot was going up to school to slap the house and things like that. So, you know, you might want to be careful with your dog outside. You know, they're not actually saying that, but. Yeah. Well, and nowadays, I mean, it used to be that no one wanted these haunted houses and now everyone's a paranormal investigator. They want to find. Yeah. So they want these houses. So I'm, I'm, I don't remember hearing about this. I could have, might have got a terrible memory, but um, that would have been really cool. 
Well, if you check our She Squatchers page, I posted about it just like yesterday or the day. Oh, before. right. I, right. I'm <laughs> sorry. I don't frequent our page. I'm sorry, I, I do frequent your page. That's how I knew about it. The Aww. truth comes out, Jenna. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't I'm check our page. I'm so busy <laughs> praising you that, you know, Jen, I'm just too busy. No, she's not. <laughs> Oh, I know she's not. Anyway, we should get back to Ron. Ron is here to share with us about about get anything that you guys want to know about. He he's got all kinds of knowledge, I guess. So yeah, all kinds. Yeah. What do you call the ones that look like fireballs in the water? Oh oh. What what do I call them? Yeah. Well, call? I mean, like in the about like a, a submerged underwater flying object. You know, you get those things every now and then. But I don't well, I don't call them anything. What do you call them? I'm just wondering if they were in your book. No, no, because very rarely do I have uh, anything uh, regarding those kind of sightings. I have told you ladies before that I, I have no problem talking about Earth energies because I've seen them many times. I've seen what would be called fairy lights or will of the wisps. I've seen it very, very many times. But um, I've never seen one in the water. I have had reports, but not in my area of Pennsylvania. Mostly because we have no um, natural lake in this area. We have some rivers, some fairly sizable rivers, but nothing that would be able to be like that. Um, uh, the Connemaw River, which runs very close to where we're we'll experienced uh, lights dancing on the top of the water, but nothing submerged. Nothing. Awesome. Well, they don't have to stay in the water. They come out. <laughs> they come out, right. Which, in, in like, in my uh, book on the aquatic monsters of the Great Lakes, um, I deal with that a little bit because that is a very prevalent um, phenomenon up in that area about seeing something that looks basically like a UFO, except it's under the water, you know. So, yeah. you know, you, you have a lot of these different type of acronyms, the underwater, you know, UFO or the submerged uh a flying vehicle and all this other stuff. Um, but uh, I uh, I have a working knowledge of it, but I'm not an expert by any means on that. It's a fascinating thing, but uh, the idea that it's a um, uh, a craft of some kind really doesn't do it for me. I don't think they're crafts either. Yeah. I know they're not crafts. Yeah. yeah, energy, energy, I think, too. Yeah. I think, I think that that's whatever, at the end of the day, yeah. I think that they have that their body is an energy body and they are a sentient being. They just don't have a body that is as solid as ours is. I agree 100%. That's exactly right. Uh, and that is um, the uh, that we don't have to investigate anymore. That's the absolute way I feel as well, too. I, I, I think that that is the thing. I think that uh, this earth is full of all kinds of magnificent creatures. And I think that they're very intelligent creatures out there that are made purely of energy and uh, they come across as all these kind of different things uh, that go bump in the night. That's all that's been my opinion now for probably the last three years of really investigating deeper and deeper into everything. And at the end of my on fairy book, that's really the conclusion that I came up with. That they are just uh, their energy bodies are different than ours. Yep. Just the energy bodies are different than ours. They interact with us and they can, uh, you know, maybe make us, think things differently or see things differently they can definitely act upon us um but it's just another form of life that we have to either learn how to accept or you know um something like that but i think that you are talking about something that's associated with wild places as well and you know we're tearing down everything this idea of this uh protective spirit of woodland areas or you know ancient whispers and trees and such you know that's getting to be few and far between now because we are destroying all that stuff and uh that's a sad commentary on who we are i agree not only are the areas being destroyed but i don't think people pay attention anymore mm -hmm. and they don't believe in those things very much anymore so they're not open to to being aware of it i agree yeah good I point agree. yeah very much so 
And just to think, especially you, you mentioned how they almost manipulate, how they can manipulate, you know, energy does manipulate, even our energy around us manipulates other people. So you'd think that these sentient beings can really manipulate us. I mean, because we've, I mean, we, we're around people and we're happy and they can feel our moods if we're projecting, you know, we can literally make people happy. I would just, I would love to see one of these in person. Jen, I think you have had a fabulous, exci- exciting experience. i jealous yeah. of. Well, um, the first time that this ever occurred to me, um, we were, and it was on, um, on, uh, uh, first which was midsummer you know this time whenever fairies come out to play you know according to shakespearean tradition and the long line of elizabethan and before that middle ages uh, uh tells um and there was light throughout the forest and it looked like um fireflies you know until uh it started to behave differently it looked almost like those led lights that somebody would have little points of energy that really wasn't doing anything but staying on. But one of the most fascinating things about it was, as you would walk through this corridor of trees, the light would almost move with you. It was a very beautiful thing to see, and I really don't know how to explain it. And it might have been a very personal experience as well, too. But it was just one of those things where it seemed as if you were surrounded by by something that recognized who you were, and that you were there to do it no harm. And it basically, um, I, I, I guess, visited and um, maybe traveled with you for a little bit and then just went about doing its other stuff and eventually disappeared. So what was the mood then, do you think? I mean, did you feel anything specific? Um, uh, elation is probably, too, it wasn't like an, a euphoria, but there was also no, no, there wasn't any negativity present either. Um, so I think that if somebody opens themselves up and just kind of eliminates the negative in their lives, I think that that really opens you up to so many things, you know, um, even in the, you know, the Judeo Christian tradition, whenever you talk about this kind of stuff, um, yeah, I was, uh, we talked about last time I was a uh, religious studies minor in college, but, um, the idea of uh, forgiving sin, you know, that this whole thing within the, the Catholic tradition, the Christian tradition, um, the Greek word that they use doesn't mean to forgive. It means to let go and let it just vanish. You say the idea of who we are as human beings who are, are supposed to be able to just simply eliminate, let go of anything that's bothering you which we find in the, you know, Taoist tradition and in Confucianism and in any other tradition around the world. Uh, that's getting back to the same source, isn't it? Just to simply eliminate all negativity from your life. So no matter what anybody does to you, you do not allow yourself to accept that negativity. And really, really awesome things can happen. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, after my um, near-death experience, that is the feeling that I felt completely 100% for the longest time. And I've slowly crept in and let things affect me again. And it's like, I want to get back to where I was. I was, you know, getting letting things go. It was so nice. So, yeah. And, and I think that there's something, I mean, we're all on a journey. I, and I'm thinking that's probably the meaning of life, isn't it? You know, we're giving this very finite amount of time on this planet to kind of wander around and try things and make mistakes, but we should always be on a path for some sort of self-discovery and the betterment of the world around you. I think that is the, that is the essential question and the essential, uh, the essential meaning of life is to you know, find ourselves and to help those around us. I think that's as, as simple as that. But so many mm-hmm. people, and myself included, uh, you you want to go out and find a job because you have to make money because society tells you you have to do that. And then you really start losing this idea of everything. And then all of your possessions now own you. You know, you have credit cards and you have to pay on the credit cards. So now that credit card has power over you. I think that what I'm going to do here, and I'll say the next month, is just simply let go of everything and uh, move into a converted bus and travel around the country. Hey, well, I've so about that many times. I have. If you ever do, you better come visit us. Oh my gosh, that would be so cool. I would. I would. Now you have to keep in mind, I have five children. 
Um, and uh, but uh, only uh, four of them will be traveling because my son is older. And oh. then uh, and my girlfriend, Julie, has two children. That's a lot of children in the bus. So I don't know how that would happen. I just thought you meant you were going to get away on a vacation, <laughs> take a bus oh, no, and I'll let everything go. <laughs> this would be my permanent way of living. I would have dreadlocks. I would raise chickens. I would make um, goat milk soap. Wow. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about doing. Cool. Yeah. If, yeah. Wow. What an idea. You're not the first one to have that idea. I think there's so many people that would love to live like that. But like you said, we get so consumed in the jobs and the paying with credit cards with, with what we own. And we do get consumed with that. And I'm totally, I totally get what you're saying. I just love talking to you. It's just so awesome. All right. And on that well, note, we're going to have to go to our, our uh, half the show break. So we'll be back in two minutes. Everybody stay tuned for it's Ronald Murphy. You know what your listeners are out there saying? When are they going to get to that damn Bigfoot? They're not talking about that damn Bigfoot. <laughs> Actually, I think that they like to hear about the faith because we talk about Bigfoot all the time. Yes. So I think it's it's interesting for everybody to hear a little bit about the other things. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to hear about yourself, too. People really yeah. are interested more, too, about the people and but it's true what you were saying. I just, you know, sometimes I have to remind myself, and I'm sure you guys both have to do this too, when things start affecting you and you're like, why did I just get so upset at that? And you have to remind yourself, like kick yourself in the butt and say, knock it off, let it go. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Just let it go. And then the powers that are meant to be, to be attracted to you will come back to you, won't they? Yes, they will. And things just seem to just flow, just like everything is... That's right. That's right. Beautiful river. It is that incredible chain of being, you know, that, that idea that we're all interconnected. Yes. I, yeah. I got to take another quick drink of my beverage. Good idea. Cheers. Cheers. It's just water. water. Just wa oh, I have the same thing. Water? Every yeah. Oh, one of these things is not like the other. I was going to sing know. it, but I don't think I can. In my I cup is a kickstart. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious so um how did the other show do did the other show do pretty well oh yep we got seconds it went great god Ten. I feel like we're blasting off. And roll. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Jen Cruz, and this is the Journey Radio Show. When we are not live on the air, you can find us at thejourneyradioshow.com. And hey, check out our other website at shesquatchers.com, because you know that's who we are. We're the all-female Bigfoot research team up here in Minnesota, North Dakota, up here in the Midwest. And... So check out our website, cheesequatchers.com, and there you'll find a little link to our Facebook page. Please go give us a like there and follow us so that you can see all of our up-to-date information on what's going on with us. We're soon to start our big tour. That's what I guess they started calling it last year because we were on tour. <laughs> and we were going everywhere. Uh, we start our tour next month in june we'll be at the virginia bigfoot conference and we go from there our last event of the year will be in november in ocean shores washington at the sasquatch summit so we're literally going coast to coast this year so check out oh that. man yeah i'm very gonna be awesome. of that too that's gonna be a great thing for you guys i know we're really excited we're really excited we're trying not to do as many events this year because we were really run ragged last year yeah, but yeah, drive your bus, drive your bus over, say hello. That's right. <laughs> well, have, you, have you been to the Pacific Northwest before, or is this your first time up? This is my first time up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mine too. Oh, that will be great. Yeah, I, I've always had a fascination with that area. So one of these days I'll get up there. Yes, great yes. Place. So while we're out there looking for Bigfoot, I think it's highly possible that we might run into some other other interesting things out in the forest, some elementals, some fae, some pukwajis. Some gnomes. 
No, uh, so definitely I, gnomes. Genesina gnome. I know. That's a great. You should probably share your gnome story. Oh my gosh, I think everybody's heard it so many yeah, times. They've already heard it. <laughs> I've told this that story so you. many times. This is about you, Ron. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> have uh, you uh, have you seen any gnomes? I've not seen any gnomes, no, no. But I, I, I have a very dear friend who owns a, a tea shop. Uh, and uh, she was out in the Pacific Northwest. And I think it was in the Redwoods of California. And she swears that she had seen a gnome. True story. Yep. So how? Like, what what happened when she saw the gnome? It was just one of those things that kind of was standing and she just, her eye just kind of was able to recognize that there was a, a creature standing there. And then whatever she did, it kind of just faded back into obscurity. Uh, yeah. Almost like those pictures that you focus and they you can see the pictures. <laughs> Very much. And I think that that's to be said for a lot of things uh, when we're talking about the world of the paranormal. And sometimes it is the eye of the beholder, isn't it, that sees it? whether we're talking about ghosts, because a lot of people can be investigating the same haunting and only one or two people see what is, you know, the haunting itself, the apparition, and the other people don't. It's really being open uh, to the, the things that are out there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. She was, very, yeah, she was very skeptical, but she's also a very cool kind of, has this very uh, neat hippie vibe to her. And I think that she was just open up to whatever was going to happen, and that's what happened to her that particular time. Very cool. And I told you about the lady that I met at a conference who said that she heard a mermaid singing outside of Reno, Nevada in a man-made lake, which is kind of interesting, too. Um, that she said, you know, she was on the shore of this lake at night and she could hear the, the that, that siren song and she immediately knew that it was a mermaid for whatever reason. Um, and again, <laughs> we're talking about even though the lake is man-made, the water is not man-made. So it's very possible these creatures can can uh, you know pop up even in suburban uh you know uh, uh nevada so pop up in just a, a pond or a lake except not connected right. to any river no it's not connected to anything it was just i i i think that whenever we talk about those particular areas and, and, and i'm not a, a, a knowledgeable about this but that's all for like um rest that's why they create these things i believe yeah Would so yeah, so I don't know where the water comes from, but I just know that the lake was man-made. So, in your book on mermaids, did it discuss how they could just appear into... Well, yeah, it does. Um, there was a, uh, a Japanese scientist, and, and I, I cannot think of his name right now, but I know that his last name begins with a Y. But he did uh, intensive research on how water will interact with a person's thoughts. That if you kind of like think very negative about it, it will actually change the crystalline form of the molecules. Mm -hmm. And if you think very positive, it becomes almost very beautiful and fluid. fluid. Um, so I think that that's what's going on there as well, too. Wouldn't that be something if nature as a whole is it is this great canopy on which we can project anything that we want to? You know, so often we project, you know, hatred and, you know, you know, war and, you know, all this other stuff. But if enough people got together and thought only good thoughts, you know, this was big back in the 70s whenever people were, you know, playing music to house plants and talking to them and stuff. But wouldn't that be something that if every living thing that you encounter, whether it be, a, you know, a tree or, you know, a blade of glass or grass or, you know, to another human being, that you just treated them with respect and dignity. I think that, I think that would change the overall um, layout of, of, of all of, you know, creation. I agree a hundred percent. And I, I re remember um, seeing that study. That was such an interesting study they did. This is a scientific study. That's right. A scientific. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> this wasn't like off of some sort of YouTube this was a guy that had grants to do this kind of thing. And yeah. it was just very, very interesting. Now, a lot of mainstream academia will not accept this kind of stuff because it has this idea that the human mind can somehow shape things. And that's really not what scientists want to hear, is it? I mean, that's kind of sad, but that's not really, I mean, some sort of cognitive scientist might, and certain type of, you know, psychologists might want to want to deal with that. But for the most part, 
you're a meat and potato scientist, they don't care that much about that. But, but what it does demonstrate is that we have power over the world around us, and the world around us also has power over us. Mm-hmm. You know, every time I hop in the shower, I always think, heal, clean my skin. <laughs> I really do, because I think it helps. Uh, I know I that's silly. <laughs> Jen knows the story. <laughs> never, I will never tell that out loud. <laughs> like, oh my God, don't go there. Image in my mind, yes, yeah. Oh, no, but really, I mean, you got to think about it. You got to be there. You got to be with the with everything around you, like we were talking about energy and and after, how we affect. After I had seen the research on mess, it's called messages in water. Is the work that he was doing? It's called messages in water. And after I saw all that research and, and the findings that he was coming up with, I took a sticky note and wrote on it all these wonderful things, and I plastered it onto my water heater. <laughs> all right, right. So I labeled my water heater, and I held that intention every time I took a shower. Very nice. Good. Yes. Very good. Yeah. That's a better yeah, idea. I like that idea. That that you know that great German word that gestalt. You know this this overall uh, effect on you know your all overall being. This very holistic approach. I like that. I like that very much. And I think that we should start doing that. This would be a good you know for a lot of people out there listening. Uh, instead of going into some you know ruined uh, mental hospital with a, uh, a tape recorder, why don't you get together and start doing some experience experiments with this? I think it'll be a very cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. Very neat. I know there's other there's other experiments that people could do at home that would go coincide with this. Like there's the the rice experiment where you have two containers of rice. I think it's rice and water, and then you you say nice. You label one with love, and you label the other one with with hate, and you 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 hold intention toward each one every day. What its label is, and you just watch them change and they they change yeah yeah i think that that's uh that's that's uh not only possible i believe that that's really what happens the same way with children you know i i work with children all the time and i'm not the perfect father but you can tell that if you are you know if you how your attitude is toward children is how they'll react to you as well Mm -hmm. very true Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know, though, as far as doing the experiments myself, I feel so bad. I couldn't hold the hate. I couldn't be mean to rice. I couldn't be mean to anything. Like, in my mind, I'd be going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm saying mean things to you, rice. You know, I know that sounds weird, but I don't like, I don't like putting negative things. Maybe Jason could do it for you. (laughs) Yeah, he would be great at it. (laughs) Jason, if you're mad at me, just direct that at the rice, would you? Take it out on the rice. (laughs) I bought something today. Just yell at the rice. Uh, (laughs) That's a great idea. You could kill two birds with one stone there. I could. I would love the rice. He would just tear it apart. There you Uh, go. I'm kidding. He's not terrible. He's not. He's (laughs) just crappy sometimes. Oh, well. That's okay. I I love doing this show, and I love to laugh with you ladies, but as I've said, something bronchial is going on every time I, I laugh. I start uh, coughing like a uh, smoking truck driver, so I apologize for that. It's okay. It's okay. Hey, you know, I, before we run out of time, because it happens so quickly. It happens so quickly. It does. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us some information about High Brazil. Which... Oh, yeah. Okay, so High Brazil, and this is something that you and I were talking about after the show when we exchanged a couple of texts back and forth. Um, the idea of this other world or a fairy realm um, is is... Uh, you know, this was something that was very vital uh, in fairy mythology, going back even to the Greco-Roman days. You know, this idea that there was this other world, you know, almost attainable to us, you know, something that could be labeled. And High Brazil was this kind of movable island um, that um, had started to show up on maps. I mean, maps up until the 1800s still had High Brazil comes off of the coast of our um, of Ireland, I've seen them in the middle of the Atlantic, almost as if it was kind of like a, a, a pseudo Atlantis. I've seen them off the coast of the Americas. Um, uh, so this high Brazil, this this magical fairyland that will appear and disappear from time to time, uh, is what people would saw. I mean, people actually went out on expeditions looking for this, and then you came up with a very groundbreaking 
um, theory, which I had never heard before. And I wish I knew about this uh, before I published the book, before it went to press. But you came up with the idea, which was? That, that it was actually a ship, not an it, island at all. I think that that is a great idea. Um, and so if we look at the Romantic poets, um, like Coleridge and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, or if we go back to the idea of like the Ship of Fools, or these ideas of even the Flying Dutchman, the, the idea that the ocean can, can hold very strange thing, part of our, you know, human identity. As soon as we look at those waves, we know that something strange can be out there, no questions asked. And your idea that this fairy island is in some way a ship, I think um, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wanted to um, have fairies as his main um, protagonist beside the hobbits in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in his Lord of the Rings trilogy, could not name fairies fairies because of the Victorian prejudice against her. And she didn't want them to be these little winged creatures. So he had to call them elves, which is a little bit of a different type of uh, resonance to us. But he wanted his elves in the Lord of the Rings to be, be called fairies. Um, but uh, uh, if we think at the end of uh, the um, Return of the King, whenever again goes off you know, uh, to the Blessed Isles at the end, it is a boat that takes them there. This idea that the, the, the fairy element can somehow be, you know, bound up and transported uh, on some sort of magical vessel um, is also part of our of our fairy lore as well, too. And I thought it was a very beautiful assumption that you made. And I think whenever I do a rewrite, I must add that in. I'll give you all the proper credit. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. But I, I think it, it has to be some type of an advanced ship that appears also like an island. There must be foliage growing on there, you know, plants and whatnot, um, <clears throat> that, it, that it actually does look like an island. But I think it, it's probably a giant advanced type of ship. Uh, um, because how could it be off the coast of Ireland in the middle of the Atlantic and off the coast of the Americas? And it's showing up that way on different maps throughout right. the hundreds of years. How could that be the same place? Very magic. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. You know, but you know, the idea, though, of uh, water being um, the conduit between worlds as well, too, is part of our tradition. And um, so this this boat would act almost as a liminal zone between the two worlds, this kind of very uh, tenuous border between the fairy realm and the, uh, the human realm. And I just think that it makes beautiful, very poetic sense to think that High Brazil might have been some sort of uh, sailing vessel. So when it appeared and disappeared, didn't it have a mist to it? There was a mist? It did, that's the thing, too. Uh, the, yeah, a fog uh, shrouded or a uh, mist entwined type of uh, uh, geological feature. So uh, when we think of like King Kong Skull Island and it's covered in this mist, and whenever you enter the, that mist, if you're if you're brave enough to, to break through that, then you're uh, witnessing all these kind of strange and unusual things. Um, you know, that's a very uh, Victorian notion. Uh, but you know, as I said before, um, this goes back very very deep into our past when we talk about fairies. Yes. So do you know any of the stories of the people that visited High Brazil when it was when it had materialized and over by Ireland? Did the stories of the people that had visited there and the people that lived on the island? You know what? Okay, so I, I, I've been able to uh, track down rumors, uh, hearsay. There was this one gentleman that said he had visited High Brazil about seven times, but uh, he was, uh, he was, you know, um, taking shots in a bar whenever this was going on. So the idea of people setting foot there and returning, I could not find any reliable evidence whatsoever about that. So it seems as if either you step on it and you never return, you step on it and you forget about your time being there, or um, you, you just simply cannot get there at all. And do, do you have any information about the people that supposedly lived on the island of High Brazil? No. Well, you would have the mythology, the mythos of great kings and beautiful queens, you know, uh, these kind of ru ruling bodies, um, very uh, indicative of the culture in which uh, was creating these, these myths at the time, these legends. Um, but I think it's always been one of beauty, 
one of everlasting youth, kind of like Chernobog. And um, it's just this ideal world, this kind of piece of heaven on earth that, that everybody is seeking. There you go. You know, it has been years since I looked into High Brazil, and I actually do know that I probably kept all of my notes in email format, so I'd never lose it. Uh -huh. um, and I can't say for sure, but I, I'm pretty sure that I had information about the people that lived on the, on the island. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if you can find it, that's perfect. Um, I, whenever I research, I like to look at um, contemporary sources. I'm sure there probably are sources out there from people that have commentated, but I know that whenever I, uh, that I had written the book, I found tells of tells, but in looking at the provenance of these kind of, uh, these kind of tells, it kind of always broke down, but you might've been able to do, uh, more focused research than I did on writing that particular chapter. And I would love to see the information. Yeah. Well, I, I was just looking online, looking for information about High Brazil. And then um, I think that I'd found the names of the, the, what they, the people that they believed lived there. And I was researching them. All right. Very cool. Very cool. So um, I think that's what it was. And we're, again, we're talking over 10 years ago, I think. So my, we're ago. we're going off we're going off my memory. That's a long time when I'm really focused on something else. Because right now I'm really focused on Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your audience enjoyed this tonight, even though we didn't talk very much about the big hairy fellow. But I think this was still fun. I think it was still very poignant to have this kind of uh, uh, discussion whenever we talk about you know Bigfoot creatures, uh, because what are they exactly? I and mean, we can talk about tree structures. We can talk about tree, you know, uh, knocks and all this other kind of stuff. But unless we delve into these kind of shadowy realms, we're not really going to see a complete picture of what we're looking for. I, I do agree. I think that people have to have an open mind about what is out there. And they can't, when they limit their ideas of what it could be, they're limiting the results of their research. So uh, when you're open to whatever it is that you find is, is what you find. And having a very open mind to whatever it is it is that you find, um, you know, that's just the way that you're going to ensure that your research is is well-rounded. Because what happens I, when I you are a flesh, and, a flesh and blood only type believer, because there are flesh and blood only type believers of Bigfoot. Oh, sure there are, yeah. And when they have a paranormal experience of some kind that they can't explain, a lot of times they sit on that and, and they don't dare tell anybody because it just shatters their idea of what they thought Bigfoot was before. That's a, that's a true story. I know researchers like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do they eventually come around to being more open-minded and sharing the story? Some of them do. Some of yeah. them do. Some not of them all do. Of them. Yeah. But just think about all the information that has been lost because people took, you know, a report and it's acting out of the unusual and they just, you know, throw it away. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Because yep. they don't You're... believe that doesn't fit into their idea of what it could be. Yeah. And they're trying to mold it into their own image. And that's not what science and research is all about. Right. Right. And when it comes to science and, and the idea that thoughts can, can affect reality in a scientific manner that's what quantum physics is all about yeah. <laughs> i love quantum physics yeah. i love that stuff yeah um, it's more sci-fi than sci-fi yeah it is um <laughs> uh my one friend uh ron moorhead i don't know if he's ever been a guest on your show but well, I, I did a we met ron last year at the uh virginia the ecbro virginia bigfoot conference he was one oh. of the speakers as we were yeah. Very cool. And he has a book out called The Quantum Bigfoot. I would love to see you guys interview him. Oh, yeah, that would be totally fun. I, was, I think we should ask him out of the show sometime. <coughs> yeah. I think you should. Yeah, he's yeah, a very okay. personable guy. Oh, yeah. He well, is. Let him know that we're interested. Say, hey, you know, I'm hey. friends with him on Facebook, Jenna. Oh, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you talk to him a lot? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I have like. I don't know how many friends now, 1,600 or 1,700 or whatever. Wow. Break it up. Break it up. I'm not breaking. There's people <laughs> out there that, that have to delete people to accept more people. I'm far from that. That's for sure. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm just teasing. My mom always said to me, she goes, when you're bragging, you're dragging. So my mom always had this great advice. So I just thought I'd. Well, my point was I have too many Facebook friends. I can't chat with them all on a regular basis. 
That's right. No offense to anyone. That's right. <laughs> so if you do talk to me on a yeah, regular would, basis, I feel wish, privileged. Yeah, I wish I could chat with all my Facebook friends. So, but I mean, that's the thing about social media. I mean, there's all these people out there that you find so interesting, but you don't have time, you know. So you have to just take little glimpses. I love social media for the effect that I might want to know how somebody's doing, but I don't have time for an hour phone call. Ah, <laughs> that's right, that's right. So I just creep over to their Facebook to check on, see what they've been up to. And then I'm like, Oh yeah, that's good. And then, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Oh no, I know what you're talking about. I know completely what you're talking about. Oh, you, you celebrated Christmas too. That's great. Let me give it a thumbs up. I, I do know what you're talking about. Right, right, right. So, but, you know, there's, you know, it had to be blessed to have so many friends that you want to talk to. That's right. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> that you don't have time. People, the only people that I want to talk to now is you guys. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, just well. that girlfriend's not there. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of all of my friends, and there will be three. It will be you two, and it will be Brian Bowden. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You're so sure. sweet. I try to be. Yes, yes. Very cool. So, On Fairies just came out. It's available on Amazon for purchase. On Amazon for purchase, yes, ma'am. The book is called On Fairies by Ronald Murphy. Go check That's it out, right. everybody. That's and right. then, what's your next book going to be? Oh, I thought about this time and time again. I think I'm going to write a book on poetry again because I do like that. Uh, media very much you know to be creative is one of those things and i think that i i, I might um, take a step back and just put out another book of poetry that's beautiful poetry of rocks it yeah. does does yeah yeah I, I don't think there's enough people doing it uh and i've always been fascinated by the uh by the specifics and the metrics of it i'm not very good i mean i try to you know work within you know certain parameters I try to have at least, you know, one sonnet in there, and you know, haikus, which I like very much. But I just love the idea that what what language allows you to express, the kind of emotions that you can express, that you can communicate this to another person so they can feel a little bit about what you're feeling, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I find myself writing poetry when I'm having an emotional time in my life. I, I don't have emotional times in my life anymore. <laughs> Did you just let it go? I'm com completely zen now, ladies. Completely zen. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Getting zen with Ron Murphy. That's right. Hey. Which will be on my next book. That's what I was going to say. That's a perfect name for his poetry book. That's perfect. Getting it's zen. Ben Ron Murphy. That's it. I, I think I, I wrote I, a blog once that was Getting Zen with Jen. Oh, right. <laughs> that rhymes, though. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me on so soon. I know that we're running out of time, so I'll give you my thanks and everything. I didn't think that I was going to be on here again until June, so I'm, I'm glad that the other person blew you off. Well, I don't think you blew us off. You just had somebody yeah. else come up that was no, more I important than us. I, so. I, I, I contacted <laughs> him. Thank you. I, I <laughs> want to be on your show so badly. You're going to have to take a hike. And he goes, okay, don't threaten me anymore, Mr. Murphy. And then I uh, said, okay, I'll cancel. That's what happened. You did oh, awesome, man. My goodness. What in yeah. the heck? That's just well, the way I roll. I'm so thankful Ooh. you could join us tonight. And, and yeah. again, everybody, the book is called On Fairies by Ronald Murphy. Go check it out on Amazon. And, hey, we're the She Squatchers. Come find us. Like us on Facebook. All that fun stuff. And we'll see you here next week. I think we've got somebody coming to us from the Minnesota Bigfoot Research Team. Whoop! I think wow. that's the next two weeks. We've got that going on with different members of the Minnesota Bigfoot Research Team. So you're going to want to make sure to check that out. Well, when am I coming back on? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we're going to kick off next. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.